Yes. See if you can get us a guy or two for Saturday. For okay, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. I'm glad you're here today. So good to be here. Because God loves you, and I love you. <laughs> and that's the way it's supposed to be. Amen? We love one another. We're a body. We need each other. Praise the Lord. So we welcome all those that are here today. We welcome our brothers and sisters that are worshiping online. Praise God that you can be part of our worship service, part of our Sunday message. So praise the Lord. Praise God. It's good to be here. This week we're kind of back to normal. No holidays coming up. So we have our regular Monday meetings, our, our meeting at Four o'clock, where we study the book of Proverbs. We're in Proverbs 13 to 14. We're working our way through each proverb slowly. It's a blessing as we study God's word. God opens our eyes to wisdom and knowledge and understanding. So if you can be part of our, our Bible study at four o'clock on Monday, you're welcome to be here. You can always jump right in. It's a good time. And then at, <clears throat> at seven o'clock, we we pray from 7 to 8. We have a time of worship and a time of praise and a time of prayer. So I encourage you, if you can be here to be with us at 7 o'clock as we worship and praise God and pray together as a body. So that's at 7 o'clock on Monday. On Wednesday, we have started a new study in the book of 1 John. We're going to go through 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So we're doing our studies in, in John's letters Last week was a good study. We studied about Gnosticism, how it's even. It was back back in in the Apostle John's day, and it's just back in our day. So we're gonna we get we learn so much, so much from these books of the Bible, so much that's so so up to date, so in our present world that I would encourage you that if you can be a part of our studies on Wednesday, you would be blessed. I do want to mention that. You know, the, the grass cutting team, the team that we pay for, they come every other week, the gardeners. So we, we need a group of brothers who can cut the grass every other week. So this is this this week coming is our week. They, they, they cut the grass, I guess it was yesterday or the day before. So if, if you can help <laughs> pardon. They cut it this morning. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess better late. The never, it would have been never. But next Saturday, our brothers are going to cut the grass. So if you can help, we only need about three or four guys. One time we had seven, that's too many. But if we have three or four, four is good, five might be too many. But if you can help, check with Brother Jake. T tell Brother Jake that you can be here on, on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, and we can probably knock it out in two hours or so. All the brothers working together, trimming and cutting and raking and sweeping, whatever needs to be done, blowing and going. So let, let Brother Jake know. Praise the Lord. I think that's all of our announcements. Qu quite a few things that are on our prayer list that we want to remember to pray for. So many of our, our loved ones are battling cancer. We want to pray for those. A, a brother that we knew years ago, J John Leger. I don't know how many of you remember him. He called Pastor Rusty and said that we'd pray for his brother, his younger brother, who's battling cancer. And I know um, Jackie's friend called up. Her her daughter, Misty, is battling cancer. And I know our, our sister Esther is still battling cancer. So many people that we know, so many of our loved ones. So we want to pray for those who are battling cancer tonight, today. We also want to continue to pray for our young brother, Christian. He's still in the hospital. I know he needs our prayers for God just to get him and his family back in the church. So we're just going to believe God's going to bring them back, shake them up, and bring them back. So Amen. that's our prayer. I know we want to continue to lift up our sister Phyllis and her sons. We want to pray for them and all of our family. We have so many of us have loved ones that are not serving the Lord that we want to Pray for our lost loved ones. And pray for our children that are serving God, too, that they continue to stay faithful because it seems like things get tough and sometimes people back off. I know we want to lift up our, our brother 
as Bill. I know we haven't seen him. We definitely want to pray for him. I don't know, he used to come with Nicole and Jake. So we want to pray for him today too. Anyone else we got to bring? Brother Jimmy. Jimmy, go on. Jimmy, go on. Jim, no, you're not. Jim Fusile. You get up here and your mind goes blank. You know, you, you won't believe it. Just try it one time. <laughs> I, I neglected to uh, thank the body for, for my friend's son that had that open heart surgery last week. I just wanted to give a report on that and saying he only spent one day in ICU. Everything was beautiful. And, and, and he's, he got home in three days from getting the his chest Lord. cracked open. Praise God. Man. And, and, and a, a, one other thing that, that I, I want to talk briefly about, me and Cindy had the chance to go to her brother's house yesterday to uh, have a party for a, 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 a wedding, all right? And his mother-in-law was staying with them, just had moved in with them because she had some, some heart troubles. And uh, we got to... She, it was her first night, was Thursday night, I think, and she was staying over at the house. And we got the chance to visit with her and talk to her for about an hour and a half at that party. Me and Cindy went and talked to her. And uh, at, toward the end, we got to pray with her. And we, we, we prayed with her uh, uh, for God's healing touch and his mercy over her. And then we left, and, and what we neglected to do was to you know, say the sinner's prayer with her, even though we know she was, she was, we, we think that she was a, a, a God-fearing woman and that she was saved. We, we, ne we, ne we neglected to do that. And uh, two hours later, they went and checked on her, and she had dropped dead in in, her, in, in the home. You know, so it was stunning at that party and the ambulances and everything. So I just want to. Remind the body when, when you know, whenever you have a chance to talk to somebody, never miss it. You know, uh, I mean, we would have been comforted more, you know, yeah. knowing we yeah. spoke to her. Yes. You know, sure. Sure. Try, try, never miss an opportunity. You know, sure. and, you know sure. Sure. amen. Yeah, you know, we we sometimes assume people are saved, but we just don't have that confidence. In our, in our heart. And that's what we want to have. Sister Linda? I just want to uh, ask the body to pray <clears throat> for Harold's family. One of uh, his cousins lost her daughter yesterday morning. She was 37 years old to cancer, and she leaves behind her husband and two small children, five and two. And they're all, everybody's just devastated over it. So that family needs a lot of prayer right now. I want to thank the Lord um, for his faithfulness always and in my life and drive and I always plead the blood. When I last week I was in the car, I was exiting, getting on uh, the interstate and, there, you know, there's no road left. So you have to merge. Well, as I did this, the truck behind me sped up and and started blowing his horn. So I just said, Lord, in Jesus name, you know, he well, he kept following me and tailgating me. And I guess he was really angry. What he didn't realize is I had no, I'm the one that merges. He's supposed to get over. He followed me for a good ways. I'm sure to try to intimidate me, but, but God preserved my life. And I, I thank him for that because today people are just so angry. They're not even realizing what the law is. I mean, I had no road. I have to merge on. But my faithful God protected me. From his road rage. Amen. Amen. We pray against that that demon behind the, so many wheels. Brother? Yes, I want to mention the uh, night before last, my one of my nephews had a heart attack and passed away uh, the next day. So I would like to pray for my sister just to comfort her. Her name is Thelma, and my uh, nephew's name was Barry. Um, I was at home watching online the Sunday that Brother David, the last time Brother David gave the message, and it was on healing. And I was at home mainly because I'd been having a lot of problems with my feet. One foot I had broken years ago, and 
it had swollen at the break and was giving me a lot of pain. The other one, I don't know why it was hurting, but it was, where I could hardly walk. And I claimed in Jesus' name that healing. And it didn't happen right then. But over the course of this time, neither one of them hurt anymore. And I'm just so grateful for his willingness to be obedient to the spirit. It's hard to get up there and obey God sometime when you don't, when the devil's telling you they're not going to be interested in that. You're not doing the right thing. You know how the devil works in our minds when God is leading us. And so I'm just so grateful and thankful that he chose to obey the Lord and give that word and have that service because I needed it. I, if no one else did, it was for me. So thank you, Lord, and thank you, Brother Rusty, for all you do when you get up there to preach the word. It's not just words. It's living word from God's word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. We do praise God. Okay. We get a microphone to Sister Mercedes over here. I had to get up because you all know for years that I had to hold on and I struggled to be able to get up and to start working. And I want to give glory to God too because uh, the song that when Brother David uh, preached and we came up for prayers, I went up. Um, I mean, the Lord, I still struggle with a little pain, which I know that is the devil trying to cripple it back into my body, but I refuse to receive it, and I'm able to walk, and uh, I mean, God has done a mighty thing, and I'm just grateful to God for, for what he has done, and praise Jesus. Amen. God is I'm very grateful that I can hear everything that people are saying <laughs> whatever you've done to the microphone thank you thank you thank you praise the lord amen, amen. you got to hear the word faith comes by hearing amen, amen. <laughs> all right let's pray we have our prayer list it's not just a wish list That's right. it's a prayer list it's like a grocery list we're going in there we're going to get everything on our list amen, amen. let's unite our hearts and our prayers as we Thank you, Jesus. Pray for our brothers, our sisters. Father, yes, we Lord. come to you this morning. Your, your humble children, your grateful children, knowing that you hear our prayers, that you love us to pray, love us to come to you. So we worship you today and we glorify you today. We yes. praise you today for your goodness in our lives, for your yes. protection, for your provision. We know your hand is over us, Lord. We know your hand is always over us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. We're so grateful. We're so thankful that, that we know you and that you, you care so much for us. Father, this morning we come to you with, with the burdens on our hearts for our loved ones. Those that are battling cancer, Lord, we bring them before you today. Our brother Perry and our sister Judy, Lord, we bring them before you. Our sister Esther and his friend Misty, Missy and John LeJay's brother. We bring these before you that are battling cancer and all those that we know in our hearts and in our minds that need your prayer. Father, we pray for them. Father, we pray for those that have lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you comfort them. Just give them a peace, Lord. And as we as we look upon those who have gone on, Lord, let, let, our, let our boldness grow greater and greater that we never hesitate to, to share your goodness and to pray, to pray the, with those that we're not confident that know you as Lord and Savior. Father, help us to have the right words, Lord Jesus, as we as we do lead people to you, Lord. We pray that you with us and lead us. Father, we thank you for the opportunities we have to, to share your gospel. We know that we are your, we are your mouth and your eyes and your hands and we ask you to use us, use us, Lord Jesus, to, to your glory. Father, we pray for those that we know that are lost, our lost family, our lost loved ones. Father, we pray that you open their blind eyes, Lord Jesus, just as you 
open the eyes of the blind. We ask you to open the eyes of these lost that don't see your goodness, don't see your glory, don't see their sinful condition. Lord, we pray that you open them, open their eyes, touch their hearts, that they can receive, receive the gospel. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that you do love our loved ones so much that you will move mightily in their lives. So we pray for all those that are battling sickness, whether it's diabetes or high blood pressure, all those, Lord, that we know that need your healing touch. We stand on your word that yes. you are the God who heals every disease. Thank you, Lord. We know that you carried away our sicknesses and all of our deeds. We confess your word, thank Lord you, Jesus, Lord. and by your stripes, thank we are healed. Thank you. We thank Jesus, you, Lord, thank you. for healed eyes and healed ears yes, and Lord. healed yes. bodies, Lord, yes. that we can walk in health. Yes. Amen, Lord. Thank Father, we pray for the missionaries that we know, those that are serving you in foreign field. We pray, Lord, that you bless them, provide their needs, keep them safe. We thank you, Lord, for their sacrifice to serve you. We ask you to bless, bless them, Lord. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in foreign lands that don't have the same freedom we have, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you use them to bring the gospel. Let them shine light in these dark lands. We pray for our brothers in communist lands and Muslim lands and in the Middle East, Lord. We pray for our, our brothers there in Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran, Lord, that need your protection and need your, your provision, Lord. <clears throat> Father, we pray for our own country today, Lord. So much lawlessness, so much iniquity in this land, Lord. We pray. We pray for peace, Lord. We pray for justice. We pray, Lord, that you would use us to bring truth and to bring to bring your light and your your healing and your deliverance. We thank you, Father, for the freedom and the privileges we have to, to freely preach the gospel and to freely worship you. Let us never see these freedoms as taken for granted, Lord. We do, we do thank you for them, Lord. Father, we pray for those that are in the hospital. We pray for those that are close to death, Lord, that their eyes would be open to the truth, that they would see the need for a savior. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray against the, the road rage that's going on in this city, Lord. We pray, Lord, for people behind the steering wheel to just have a, a peace and a love. And Father, we pray for those that have lost loved ones in these recent tragedies, oh, yeah. the tragedy there in Illinois, Lord. We pray for these families, these children, Lord, that have been hurt and Father, we pray for the families that have lost loved ones. We pray for all the evil, Lord. We pray against it in the name of Jesus, that you would use these evil, wicked times, Lord, to your glory, that people's eyes would be open to the truth, that our time is short, and it's time for us to get right and to press in to really serve you. Father, we pray for our, our area, the Gulf South, Lord, during these times of storm. We thank you, Lord, that you do calm the storms. Thank you. Ask you to continue, Lord, to protect us, deliver us from, from the storms in the Gulf. And Father, we do know that it's your hand over us, Lord, that mm -hmm. continues to protect us. Right. Father, we give you glory today for the yes, freedom we have to hear the gospel preached, to hear the word yes. preached. We ask you to open our, open our hearts and our ears today as we hear your word. You, Bless it, Lord, to our hearts. In Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank Praise Thank the Lord. Lord. Good morning. Good to see y'all. Uh, appreciate the testimonies things each, each one of you shared. Uh, appreciate the testimonies of healing. I told Brother David we're going to have him share the rest of that message. He didn't get to get finished with it. <laughs> so we'll have him share the rest of it later this month. Praise God. Y'all brought Bibles? I'd like for you to make your way to two passages of Scripture. 
We'll begin in Ephesians 5. And then from Ephesians 5, we'll make our way over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, a few weeks ago, I taught a couple of messages that I, I called those messages in an evil time. Because uh, that's the time we're living in right now, an evil time. These are evil days, as the Bible says. And I, I brought out uh, several things in, in those messages, and I'd kind of like to continue along those lines today because there are a few things that have been heavy in my heart. So uh, Ephesians 5, these are passages we looked at a couple of weeks ago, and we'll look at again today. I hope we don't get tired of looking at them. But Ephesians 5.15 says, see then, see to it, make sure that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. See then that you walk. And, you know, to walk, this is how we live. That's what the Christian walk is, the Christian life. It's got everything to do with your life, your lifestyle, your behavior, uh, not just actions, but thoughts, words, attitude. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly is an interesting Greek word. It really means like uh, to be uh, exact, to be precise, to be very diligent, to be very accurate. Uh, it's sometimes translated to be very careful. But think about it this way, to be exact, to be precise. Imagine there are certain jobs, professions, careers that require precision. If you're a doctor, or let's say you're going to a doctor, and the doctor has to operate and remove something. I, I sure want to go to a doctor that's precise, that's going to be careful, that's not going to be haphazard and lackadaisical. No, I'll just cut anywhere and take care of business around here. You, you want, when it comes to being circumspect, it means to be accurate, to be precise, to, to be exact. Uh, even a carpenter, you know, he's got to measure carefully so he doesn't ruin the board. You got measure twice, cut once, you know, the old expression. Engineers, boy, they have to be precise. They, everything's got to be measured with great precision. Architects like Brother Paul, I mean, these guys have to be precise. It's not like, oh, you know, this wall... Imagine building a skyscraper, uh, how, how precise everything has to be. Imagine engineering an aircraft, a spacecraft. I don't want to be in an airplane where the designer or the builder was haphazard, sloppy. You know, he walks away from the job thinking, you know, I sh probably should have put a few more screws in that wing, <laughs> you know. You, you, you're, looking for, you're looking for precision. Well, if it's critical to be accurate and, and pre precise and careful when life is at stake, how much more important is it to be careful, diligent, precise, accurate when eternity is at stake? Amen. And not just our eternity, but the eternity of others around us, those who see us, who, who know us, who are influenced by our example, and you are an influence to others. You influence others whether you realize it or not, you are an influence. So here's what the Bible says. You look to it. You be sure that you walk circumspectly because, well, you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is expected of you Amen. to follow as best you can, to live like you should. Amen. And because, as we'll see in the very next verse, these are evil times. 
So you want to make sure that you are walking carefully, diligently with the Lord in these evil days. In, e in an evil time, you don't want to live like the evil doers. He says, like one version translates this, look carefully how you live. Look carefully. Be careful in the way you live. That's how Williams translates it. It says, so you must be very careful how you live. Be very careful. Others are watching. The devil is waiting. And the Lord is expecting you to live like a Christian. And then he says, not only walk circumspectly, not as fools. Don't walk like the fools walk. Don't talk like the fools talk. Don't live like the fools live. There's several different Greek words that are translated fools. Uh, one of them is aphron. It means to be mindless, to be ignorant, to be stupid. Uh, moros is another. It means a moron. That's where we get our word moron. But the Greek word here, not as fools, is a sophos. It's spelled A-S-O-P-H-O-S. A sophos. It comes from the Greek word sophia, which means wisdom. In fact, the Greeks had a goddess they called Sophia. She was the goddess of wisdom. But not as a sophos. Because, you know, when you put an A in front of a word in the Greek, it means the opposite of that. So we were teaching on Gnosticism uh, Wednesday night, and Gnostic is spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C, a Gnostic. A Gnostic, it means to know or now, to have knowledge. Put an A in front of Gnostic, and what have you got? You've got an agnostic, which means they have no knowledge. Like an agnostic is somebody who has no knowledge of God. They, uh, they're not atheists. They're not adamantly saying there is no God, but they're saying, if there is a God, I have no knowledge of him, and I don't see him, and I don't know him, or, you know. So you put an A in front of sophos, sophos meaning uh, here wisdom, or if you put an A in front of it, means you have no wisdom. It's the opposite of wisdom. So when he says, don't walk as fools, don't walk as those without wisdom, without sense. Don't live and walk like the unwise, those without wisdom, the foolish unsaved. Who is more unwise than those who live their life with no view or understanding of eternity that's just ahead? Amen. Because, boy, as we've heard today and we hear all the time, life is very, very short Amen. and so very, very fragile. He says, let us therefore consider carefully how we live. Don't, like, don't live like the fools, Amen. but live like those who are wise. Because, he says in verse 15, we're to redeem the time. Take advantage of the time. Take full opportunity of the time you have. You don't know how much time that is. We heard that testimony today. You don't know when's the last time you'll see someone. You don't know when's the last time you'll have an opportunity to share. Redeeming the time, it, it, it means don't let it go to waste. You know, you can't rewind and live yesterday over again. You can't rewind life and, uh, and do it better the second, the second time. You have to just move forward because the clock keeps moving forward. You can't rewind life. Redeem the time. Take advantage of it. I think it's uh, Psalms 90 where the psalmist says, Lord, teach us to number our days so that we can apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us, Lord, to number our days. He's not saying count the days, you know, like, well, you're 50 years old. How many days is that that I believe? He's not saying count the days. He's saying make your days count. Make them count. Make them amount to something. Don't waste them. Don't squander them because you don't know how long you have. You only have a limited number. That's right. And we don't know the limit. Redeem the time 
take advantage of the opportunities that we have because these are evil days. That's what he says in verse 16, because the days are evil, because these are evil days, these are evil days, these are days worse than before, worse than yesterday, these are evil times. So we can't walk and live like the evil doers. It's, it's vitally important that you and I walk circumspectly like the wise not like the fools. If they're evil times, what is it that 2 Timothy calls them? He calls them perilous times. Or in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that's the other passage I wanted you to turn to with me, if you'd make your way over there. 2 Timothy 3. Again, passages that we've read before, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, says, This know also, there are things that we must know, things we must have fixed in our minds, that in the last days wonderful times will come upon the earth. Life will be just wine and roses. I mean, it's just in the last days perilous perilous times grievous times hard times difficult times violent times dangerous times will come by the way there's no maybe here there's no might could be no you know possibly it's they shall come these days shall come and as weymouth weist and vincent all say these greek scholars When he says that they shall come, it means they will set in in the last days. They will set in. You know, you set something in. You set it in cement. It's fixed now. It's established. It's that's what's going to happen in the last days. These perilous, dangerous, violent, difficult, hard days will set in. They'll move in, establish themselves and become the new normal. And in the new normal, verse 2 says, men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, truce breakers. He goes on and says, false accusers, incontinent, uncontrollable, they're fierce, you can't control them. Despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And from such, well, you turn away from that. I do believe that we are in these times right now. I do believe the perilous times have come. I believe it has come swiftly and established itself quickly as the new normal. Nowadays, you hear of mass shootings all the time. A callousness has come over America that we never really quite experienced anything like it before. The road rage that we talked about today, so much anger, so much, it's like people get behind a wheel and their personalities change. It's like something takes over them. It has so entrenched itself, this new normal, which is a demonic normal. This new normal has so entrenched itself that it's going to take a mighty act of God to ever dislodge it. And uh, I I don't want us to read these passages and, and diminish. I don't want it to diminish our prayer for revival. I don't want it to diminish our expectation for a, a mighty move of God because you know, the light can shine in the darkest place. That's right. The light can shine in the darkest place where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And we are in a dark time. This is a dark time in America. It's a dark time all over the world. I take, I take hope in passages like Acts 2, where Peter was preaching. He said, these, these, they got all, all filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in tongues. People think they're all drunk. Peter said, these are not drunk, as you suppose. And then he quotes Joel chapter 2, it shall come to pass 
that I'll pour out my spirit in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit in the last days upon all flesh. He goes on, says, your sons and daughters will prophesy on your handmaidens. I'll pour out my spirit. Your old men will, or your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And he goes on and says, in those days, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke and the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall be that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, some of this started to be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost because Peter said, this is that, this is that. But this was just the beginning of that. Because there is some of this yet to be fulfilled, and my expectation is that it's going to be fil fulfilled in our generation. That my expectation is that the Lord is going to do something, that he is going to move, that there will be a, a move of God. I don't know if it'll be nationwide, maybe pockets of revival here and there. But I'm praying for God to move and to move powerfully and wonderfully. Amen. You know, a couple of weeks ago when I spoke on these verses, uh, I emphasized that that the enemy was attacking. He was he had aimed all of his guns at the family, yep. and that his intention was to destroy to destroy the family unit because that's the building block of society, right. and. And the devil's been very, very successful at that. He's aimed his guns at the family, and look what has happened. Yeah. You know, God designed the family, uh, one man, one woman. They marry, they have children, they live together, they raise their children together. That, that is a strength. That we need to regain the understanding of how important it is to have the family strong, established in the Lord, settled in the word of God. And what we've got today is destruction, chaos. Sin, sin of course, is what caused it all. And mankind, uh, womankind became selfish and so on. Family units destroyed. You can't define what a family is. Can't, de can't define what a woman is, as I mentioned last time. I, uh, I'm not going to repeat that message, but I do want to point out today in particular that Satan's warfare was not only against the family, but Satan's warfare is against our children. Yes. That's right. Satan's warfare is against our children. You're right. He has targeted the children not just your and my children, I'm talking about all children. Yeah. He has targeted the children. Uh, in fact, this passage here in 2 Timothy 3, you can, you can relate a lot of it to how it's affecting these evil times, perilous times are affecting children. Lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without normal affection. A lot of this has to do with, with children. I do, I do have several points I'd really like to make today dealing with Satan's warfare against our children. I don't know how far I'll get, but I'm going to get at least this first point covered that I want to make, uh, Satan's warfare against our children. The first point I want to make is this warfare begins, it begins with the unborn. Satan's warfare against our children begins with the unborn. Before they are even born, right. Satan has targeted them for destruction. What does the devil do? Steal, kill, destroy. That's, right. That's what he does. Steal, kill, destroy. Before they are born, the devil is out to destroy them. Right. Through abortion. Yeah. 
I mean, not just through sickness. I believe Satan's the one who brings sickness, disease, pain. I believe it's through the fall. We have all the deformities, malignities, all of these things, I believe, directly related, related to the fall, directly related to sin. But his big weapon today has been abortion. In fact, it has made the most dangerous place in the world, the most dangerous place in the world for any human being in their own mother's womb. That's the most dangerous place in the world, all over the world. There are a lot of dangerous places in the world, by the way. There's, I mean, we, we think New Orleans is unsafe. And, and I would agree with that. Uh, the Ukraine, we think about the Ukraine, how unsafe is that? Yeah. Artillery shells falling, uh, missiles falling as Russia continues its invasion of the Ukraine. But there are places more dangerous than the Ukraine. Sure. Places more dangerous than, uh, than the most dangerous parts of New Orleans. Uh, there, there is a place more dangerous than swimming with the sharks. <laughs> or or walking the rim of a live volcano. Have you ever heard of a place called Snake Island off of Brazil's coast? Well, 20 miles off the coast of Brazil in the Atlantic Ocean, there's a little small island. It's not very big at all. It's, uh, but they have, a, they have a name for it. They call it Snake Island. It's considered one of the 10 most dangerous places on Earth. And that's because it's inhabited by uh, a poisonous pit viper that's considered the most dangerous uh, snake in the Americas. And this pit viper, this is unique to that particular island, uh, Snake Island. It's called a Bothrops viper, Bothrops viper. Now, they did a, a film on this island some time ago. And they claimed that there were five snakes in every 10 square feet of this island. Yeah. That's how infested it is with these snakes. Five snakes for every 10 square feet. Yeah. Now, I've heard that that might have been an exaggeration, that they wow. probably not that many. But they did say, which is, is definitely true, Brazil has had to make this island off limits. Nobody can go there yeah. because you, if you step foot on that island, yeah. you probably won't step out, off of it. Uh, so it's off limits, prohibited. Sometimes when you see signs that say, do not enter, you should probably listen to those, you pay attention to those signs. But, so, so I can understand how that would be a very dangerous place. But there are places more dangerous than that. Uh, there's another place that showed up on that list of the most dangerous places on earth. It was called Natron Lake in Tanzania. It's covered with an al it's a lake covered with an alkaline salt crust that is so poisonous, if you get in it, you die. Any living thing that gets in that lake dies. Any living thing, doesn't matter what it is. That's how deadly it is. So you should also pay attention when the sign says no swimming. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about this particular lake, they said it's, it's, it's so beautiful that it's almost mesmerizing. That's the word they use. It's like compelling, but it smells really bad. So... <laughs> So there are many dangerous places in the world, all kinds of dangerous places. But all of those dangerous places combined have not killed nearly as many as abortion, uh, which conservative estimates are that about 600,000 are aborted in the United States a year. That's very conservative uh, estimates. Other, other estimates range a million plus. Um, also about 61 million since 1973, 61 million 
61 million. That's more than the entire population of England. And without a doubt, the slaughter of 61 million has to be a huge factor in God's opinion of the United States of America, uh, a nation filled with Bibles, religious broadcasts, churches, tracts. I mean, of all the nations that are, have no excuse, uh, I would think I would think America is at the top of that list. But, uh, but this kind of abortion statistic is just part of the tragic consequence of the wanton immorality that has plagued America for, right. for decades. Uh, I know that you've probably seen the news. The protesters are out in force right now. They are enraged, enraged because the Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade. Uh, Roe versus Wade hung uh, it hung on a on an impossible to defend position have you ever seen a film or maybe you are a mountain climber no prob probably not yet I, I would believe you have more sense than to be a mountain climber but you ever see a film about mountain climbers how they they take that little spike and they stick it in the rock face and and climb up and and then when they want to rest they're on a sheer cliff they drive a, a a stake into a little crack in the rock drive that stake in there they got a rope that goes through the eye of the stake and then they just hang there yeah. hang hanging on a cliff sheer drop little bitty stick holding it you know Holding them, holding up their life, and they're eating a sandwich or uh, <laughs> drinking a little water out of their container, and even sleep in positions like that, wow. hanging by a little stake stuck in a rock. Well, the little stake stuck in a clause in the Constitution that allowed us the right to privacy is what the Supreme Court, 1973, in their Roe v. Wade decision, said. Uh, well, the right to privacy means women uh, have the right to abort their children. Wow. That, that's the little bitty stake that went into that crevasse. And the whole of the abortion argument hung on that little peg, wow. the right to privacy. Wow. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the, the supreme advocate of abortion rights and every, every other wicked thing, said that was a bad decision to base Roe v. Wade on the right to privacy. It should have been based on something something better, like equal protection or whatever. But they were in such a hurry to pass a, an abortion bill that they hung it on that peg. Sooner or later, that peg had to give away. It had to fall, and it finally did, thank God, much prayer was involved, much prayer, much prayer by many, many people. Uh, the peg pulled out the wall, and there is no constitutional right to abort a child. It doesn't exist in the Constitution. They forced that in there. But I want you to think about, about this. God designed the mother's womb to be the perfect, safe, nurturing place to grow a child. It was designed by God to be safe, to produce life, healthy development, healthy life for mankind, made in the image of God. The womb was designed by God to be the safest place on earth. It has since become the single most dangerous place on the earth for a child, its own mother's womb. And this is a very serious matter, very, very serious matter. Amen. Proverbs 6 and verse 16 says, these six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven 
are an abomination unto him. And what are those seven things? A proud look, a pride of any kind, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. Who is more innocent than the unborn? Than the child? That, who's more innocent than that? There, there is no one more innocent, no one that deserves more of our protection than the unborn. I mean, you think about it. What crime did they commit that caused them to deserve the death penalty? What crime did that child commit, that unborn child, that they would get the death penalty? We don't execute killers. We don't execute guilty people. That fell in Illinois, Highland Park, Illinois, shot over 50 people or 40 something wounded, seven dead. They won't execute him. Illinois don't even have a death penalty. They abolished the death penalty in 2011. There's no death penalty in Illinois. No, no matter how many he kills, he, he won't suffer the, the real consequences for his crime. Few do, very few do. But the unborn, they have committed the worst crime of all. They have inconvenienced the crime of inconvenience, inconvenienced their mother. They would be a bother. They would be a burden. They would be an expense that I just don't want to have to deal with. Uh, we did read a passage just a minute ago, 2 Timothy 3, 2, in the latter days men will become, and women, lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves without normal affection. Without normal affection for a child. And I do believe that the public all across America has been lied to and deceived by the pro-abortion advocates. You've been told, not only it's your body, it's your choice, but you're not killing a baby. You're not killing a baby. It's not alive. It's not a viable life. It's just a blob of cells. That's all it is. We can, we can just go in there and flush that out and, and you can get rid of it like you'd get rid of an unwanted tumor or something like that. Uh, the hypocrisy of it is that the same people who advocate, advocates of abortion, we can, we can go in there and remove that non-viable embryo, that fetus, that unborn baby. We can go in there and just remove that because it's not a viable life. If you said, well, I'm just going to go grab a couple of these uh, bald eagle eggs and uh, scramble them, see how they taste. Ah. Under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act of 1940, if you deliberately destroy or even disturb an eagle's nest, the fine used to be $100,000 and up to a year in jail for the first offense. The fine has since increased to $250,000. Don't even touch an eagle egg. You better not touch it. You better not get close to one even trying to take a picture. They are protected and those laws against Touching an eagle egg is strictly, strictly enforced. There might be a little bit hypocrisy in some of this because they, they would be outraged. The same people who advocate for murdering babies in the womb would be appalled if you blended eagle eggs or owl eggs or... You know, animals get more protection than human beings. Since 1973, with the, with the Roe v. Wade decision, abortion is legal in all 50 states. The result has been devastating. The most conservative estimate I've ever read was that 41 million have been aborted 
up to 61 million, which they believe is more accurate and not, that might not even count all of them. In eight states right now, it's legal to perform an abortion through the ninth month. In New York, you can kill a child up until just before it's born. In Florida, Florida has some pretty strict laws about a lot of things. You know, they protect sea turtles, or you better not mess with the sea turtle. You go to jail, you mess with a sea turtle, or if you fool with its eggs. The Florida manatee, you have to give them wide berth. If you're a boater in Florida, and there are manatees in the area, they almost want you to paddle your boat to get away that you don't run over a, a, a manatee. The Florida panther, Extremely protect, protected, but also in Florida, still to this day, as of this morning, you can still abort a human child up until the 24th week of, of its life. That's a six-month-old child. That's right. Yeah. I suspect that some of that's going to change pretty quick. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. But at, at this very time, you know, at six months old, a, a child in the womb has a heartbeat, yep. it's got brain activity, yep. uh, it's got its own set of fingerprints, you know, hands, toes, fingerprints. It's even considered viable outside of the womb at six That's months of age. Right. That's right. Wow. Lord have mercy. I want to read something to you. I don't intend to disturb you, but it's disturbing about aspiration abortion, the most common kind used in the United States. It's sometimes called vacuum abortion. And I just went to a medical website and looked up aspiration abortion. And I wanna read something to you. It's very short, but it's, they just, it's, just, it's just so clinical, so, so matter of fact. But this is what the medical website said. An abortionist uses metal rods or medication to dilate the woman's cervix and gain access to the uterus where the baby resides. I found it very interesting that they called it a baby. Where the baby resides. The abortionist then inserts a suction catheter to vacuum the child from the womb. The suction machine has a force approximately 10 to 20 times the force of a household vacuum cleaner. The procedure is completed as the abortionist uses a sharp metal device called a curette. It's a big spoon with a sharp, sharp edge to empty the remains of the child from the mother's uterus. They vacuum the child from the womb. Now, how powerful a vacuum is that? Because the tube is very small and it is able to suck an entire child. It's got to liquefy the child, a living, unanesthetized child. Suck it, liquefy it, suck it through a tube. And then they go into the uterus with the curette big sharp spoon and they scrape out what's left of little fingers and toes and tissue and pieces of the child. They scrape the rest of it out and send the mama home uh, and say, you're free from this terrible burden that yeah, they call it women's health. Now the mother can go home happy that she has brought her child to sacrifice to the great God of convenience. I read something else. This, if you can bear with me, this is from Michael Brown's book, uh, Jezebel's War with America is the name of his book, but he has a section in here on abortion and uh, he cites a pro-life a reader on a pro-life website, a, a writer named uh, Rachel Cox. And this is what she said. You know, she's talking about the hypocrisy, how we protect the animals, kill the babies. 
uh, absolute utter hypocrisy. But here's what she said. She said, let's say I have a puppy, but I can't afford one at this stage in my life. Because, you know, lack of money is the reason, most frequent reason people give for uh, having an abortion. I just can't afford it. It's too much of a burden. So let's say you have a puppy, but you really can't afford it. So what do I do with this puppy? Since it's still small, I'm going to cram it in a blender while it's conscious and liquefy it into a bloody soup and then, dis then dispose of the concoction in the trash. What would you think if you heard somebody did that to a puppy? What would the pro-abortionist do if they heard that people were doing that to puppies? You have a puppy you want to get rid of, just bring it, I'm going to liquefy it in this blender and we'll just pour it out. What do you think would be the outcry of the public and the media if people were doing that to puppies or kittens? I mean, it's unimaginable what they would want to do to the person who was doing that. Unimaginable what they want to do to them. You know, they'd, they'd arrest them in a heartbeat. Of course, they'd want them to have them mentally examined because they also say there is a direct, indisputable connection between cruelty to animals and harm to human beings. There's no mistaking the link. If you hurt an animal, you will hurt a person. That, that, that's uh, undeniable. So the lady keeps writing. She says, you could do that to a small puppy, but what if you had a, an older dog, a bigger dog? It wouldn't fit in a blender. So then, without using anesthesia, I'm going to chop each of the dog's legs off one by one with a pair of bolt cutters. But the dog is still alive at this point, so the job isn't over. Now I'm going to pick up a giant rock and crush the dog's head. And then I'll throw its mangled body in a biohazard bag. You think that's pretty cruel? Think that's pretty vile? Yep. Think that's violent and uh, disgusting? Yes. She said, these two methods are basically the same methods used yep. to kill thousands every day, thousands of fetuses every day. Right. The first procedure I described is very similar to an aspiration abortion, which is commonly performed in the first trimester of pregnancy. The second method I described, you know, the bolt cutters chopping off the legs and so the second method is akin to the dilation and evacuation abortion used in the second trimester. There are other methods of abortion besides these, not one of them could be considered nonviolent and they all result in death. 61 million, 61 million. They call this a hidden sin in America because it's done behind closed doors in a sterile, so-called sterile clinic, a women's health clinic. Uh, and another pro-life writer, Eric Scheindler, he, this is what he wrote. I think it's extremely pleasing to the devil when an abortion takes place. This wickedness happens in the dark. The womb is an invisible place. We don't see the abortion happening. Even the photographs that we have of aborted babies are very rare. They are hard to come by because this is a hidden evil and they want it to stay that way. They don't want people to know what really happens in an abortion. It's one that digs its roots so deeply in our society because it happens in secret and so many people are complicit in it, and it gradually wears away people's, insen people's sensitivity. And as our hearts get harder and harder, right. we have fewer and fewer problems with even the most extreme forms of abortion, particularly late-term abortions. 
which is why when New York passed its radical pro-abortion law in early 2019, allowing abortion up to the moment before delivery. Can you handle a little bit more? Consider the firsthand testimony from Brenda Platt Schaefer, a registered nurse from Dayton, Ohio, who testified before the House Judiciary Committee on March 21st, 1996, about a partial birth abortion she witnessed on a preborn baby boy at six months gestation. Her testimony is this. He delivered the baby's body and the arms, everything but the head. The doctor kept the baby's head just inside the uterus. The baby's little fingers were clasping and unclasping. His feet were kicking. And then the doctor stuck the scissors through the back of his head. And the baby's arms jerked out in a flinch, a startled reaction like a baby does when he thinks he might fall. The doctor opened up the scissors, stuck in a high-powered suction tube into the opening and sucked out the baby's brains. Then they deliver the baby's head, they cut the umbilical cord, deliver the placenta, they throw the baby in a pan along with the placenta and the instruments. And this nurse said, I saw the baby move in the pan. I asked another nurse and she said, it's just reflexes. This lady said, I've been a nurse for a long time. I've seen a lot of death, people maimed in auto accidents, gunshot wounds, you name it. I've seen surgical procedures of every sort, but in all my professional years, I've never witnessed anything like this. And then Michael Brown asked this question, is this any better than burning babies on the altar of Moloch? Is it any better than burning babies on the altar of Moloch? We claim to be a civilized people. These seven things are an abomination to the Lord. Those that shed innocent blood. That has to be everybody involved in the entire abortion procedure. Not just the doctor, the nurses, attendants, assistants. It doesn't matter if it's the secretary, the person who answers the phone. You are complicit. It doesn't matter if you're the mother or the father or whoever would encourage the procedure. It puts you in, it puts you in God's bullseye because he calls it an abomination. Those who shed innocent blood, it's an abomination. I, I want you to look with me to another passage of scripture. I want you to turn with me to Psalms 106. Let's, let's turn over here in our Bibles, if you would. Psalms 106. I want to read a couple of verses and ask, I think Michael Brown asked a good question about the, the difference between what we're doing and, and what, the, what the apostate Jews did in offering child sacrifice to Moloch. In Psalms 106, verse 34, that's where I'm going to begin. This is God's condemnation of Israel at the time. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them. Instead, they were mingled among the heathen and they learned their works and they served their idols. And boy, they had many idols. They worshiped all kinds of idols, which were a snare to them. They bowed before these idols. They worshiped the idols, all kinds of idols, the Baal, the Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was the female goddess called Astart, Ishtar, Asherah, moon goddess. Uh, and she was worshiped, by the way, with ritual prostitution. There were the Baals. Then there was Moloch. Moloch, the devil, who demanded child sacrifice. 
Moloch was a giant brazen statue with a belly uh, that they could put fire in and heat it up. It had a lap. It had arms extended where people would bring their living babies and put them in the, in the lap or put them in the hands of Moloch. Of course, it was burning red hot at the time, and, and the children would just fry alive. And uh, while they were screaming, then the, the pagan priests would just beat drums loud, loud, loud to drown out the screams of, of the crying children. Here's what God said. They served their idols, the pagan idols that were a snare. Yes, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood even the blood of their sons and their daughters whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. The land was polluted. They sacrificed the innocent. They shed innocent blood, the Bible says in verse 38. You know, they believe that if they sacrificed the unborn or the newly born here, to Molech, that he would give them favor, make their fields and flocks fertile, and give them many children. And so they shed innocent blood. Moloch demanded the blood of the innocent. Wow. And what does the Bible say in verse 37? They sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto devils. Devils, King James, demons. They sacrifice to demons. Let's not mistake this. Let's, let's make sure we recognize the spiritual power behind the demand for innocent blood. There is a demonic power. The devil himself, I'm convinced, the devil himself is behind this demand for innocent blood the blood of the innocent. Yep. It's a spiritual thing. It's not just a, a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Yep. There's something spiritual behind it. They sacrificed unto devils. Amen. In Jeremiah 32 and verse 35, there's another passage that says, they built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And Deuteronomy 32 and verse 17 says, they sacrificed unto devils. That's what they did. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, but unto devils. The New Testament says the same thing. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 20 and 21, I say that the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I don't want you having fellowship with devils. Amen. This is the devil's work. Oh, yeah. It's pure and simple, the devil's work. In fact, you can look at the anger, the rage yeah. in the face of the protesters oh, yeah. and see devils. You can see devils in their face, devils in their eyes. They are under the influence of demonic power. Under the influence of demonic power, without a, without a doubt in my mind, they're calling this the summer of rage. And, and to churches, this is the banner, they say. You keep your theology out of my biology. Wow. Remember the first murderer? Cain killed his own brother. And God said to Cain, what hast thou done? What have you done? The blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. If the blood of one cries out to God from the ground, what must be the sound of 61 million innocent souls crying out to God? It's got to be something we can't, we, we can't even begin to uh, wrap our, our minds around it. The protesters are demanding the right to choose. Yeah. We, we demand the right to choose 
to deny our unborn children the most basic right of all, and that's the right to live. That's right. yeah. We choose that they have no choices. Right. We choose that they die. Amen. The most basic fundamental right of all is the right to live. Amen. I also believe that this devaluation of life, human life in the womb, has led to the devaluation of human life everywhere else. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. If the womb is not a safe place, right. then there is no place okay. safe. Yeah. You're right. If the most innocent of all can be butchered so callously, right. then no life at all is sacred. There's so much more that I could share here, how God has a plan and purpose for every life. Yeah. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God knew Jeremiah before he was born, before he was formed in the womb. And the same thing is true for each and every person, each and every person. You are known unto God even in the womb. God knew you, knew you by name, even in the womb, even before the womb. Amen. There's a passage over in Psalms 139. If you want to turn there with me quickly, I do want to read this. This is a, this is a wonderful passage about God's intimate knowledge of each and every one of us, even in the womb. Psalms 139, verse 13, he says, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. You have possessed my reins, you formed my inward parts, you're the one who put me together inside my mother's body, you covered me in my mother's womb. To cover means to fence in, to protect, to shelter. The womb was a place of safety. The womb was designed to be a safe environment. It means to cover also means to knit together inside my mother. I will praise you, verse 14, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows quite well. My substance was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. My substance, my framework, speaks of the bones, the skeleton, the very substance of the body. It was not hidden from you while I was being more formed in secret, in the womb, out of sight, hidden, being formed in secret. Like one version says, I was being formed in, I was being skillfully woven in an underground workshop. Wow. <laughs> verse, verse 16 says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, really unformed. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God saw the embryo as a person. He saw each and every one of them as a living, breathing, viable person. And I believe he had a plan for each and every one of them. Amen. Listen to how one version translates verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book, all my days were recorded even those which were purposed before they had come into being. God had a plan and a purpose for that life, had given that life an allotment of years, appointed, planned, but then aborted. You know, I could, I could carry on for a while here, but I would like to conclude just just saying that uh, we must value all human life. Amen. 
every race, every nationality, every ethnicity, all are precious in his sight. We ought to consider life precious, a precious gift, a very precious gift. We must value the life and the right of the unborn to live. I do believe that we must be men and women of prayer. We must continue in prayer. This battle is not over. It's far from over. Um, I do believe that our nation needs repentance desperately. It needs a, yes. eyes to be opened Amen. to the preciousness of, of life. I believe we need to care about mothers who are with child and and clueless as to what to do, uh, which means I believe we need to do everything we can to help support those organizations and ministries that specifically reach out to uh, unwed mothers. Most abortions are from the unwed mothers, the, yeah. almost all of them really, from the unwed mothers. Uh, and these, these people don't need to be hated by us. They need to be, we need to be caring, yeah. uh, gracious, kind. Uh, they need Jesus. They need Jesus oh, desperately. Yeah. They so desperately need the Lord. Yeah. So it means we can do what we can do to give to, to those groups, organizations, ministries that are reaching out and helping. We can volunteer to help ourselves. And yes, it means that as a Christian, I believe we can vote for pro-life candidates. Oh, that's right. In fact, I'm going to tell you the truth. No Christian who knows their God, and if you're a Christian, you know your God. I don't see how you could ever, ever vote for a pro-abortion candidate. I don't care what other thing they stand for. That's the deal breaker right there. If they are pro-abortion, they are on the devil's side. And, and certainly... We don't want to condemn anyone because, you know, I got one last verse. You, you don't have to turn. You can just listen. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't want to condemn anybody because, you know, we all come from backgrounds where we did a lot of bad stuff. In ignorance, in ignorance, and in our sinful lives. But here's what the Bible says. Don't you know? I'm, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10, 11. Don't you know the unrighteous? will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Not fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or the effeminate or abusers themselves with mankind. Not thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers or extortioners. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. We were all unsaved, lost, doing ungodly things, thinking ungodly thoughts, saying ungodly words. Such were some of you, right in the church, those who came out from the world from sin of all kinds, including murder. Paul the Apostle was a murderer of Christians. Before he was Paul the Apostle, he was Saul of Tarsus, the zealous Jew. Such were some of you, but now you are washed. Thank you, Jesus. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. He forgives. And he won't hold your sins against you. One of the great definitions of the word forgive is to set free. That's one of the great definitions. Because, you know, to forgive means many things. Pardon but it also means to release. You know, like if a person is uh, forgiven of a debt, what does it mean? You're released from it. Amen. You're forgiven. You are set free from that debt. Well, we are set free from the debt of sin that we owed because of our past lives. Set free. When, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, my daughter... Jennifer, we, we, we talked and she said, Dad, Moloch is very angry because he wants that blood. Moloch wants that blood. Brother David, would you share very briefly what you shared with me this morning, just this morning, if I give you this microphone? 
Brother David had no idea what I was going to speak on today. Nobody knew what I was going to speak on today. I didn't, I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anybody. But Brother David came to me just before church started, and he said, Brother Rusty, I have to tell you, the Lord, Lord's given me something I've got to tell you, and I want you to hear what it was. I had a dream last night. <clears throat> and the interpretation of a dream is this. Molech is angry. And I made a recording of this this morning. It took me 15 minutes to record the dream and the interpretation. So Molech is angry. In our White House, this is what the dream showed me. In our White House, they are literally performing witchcraft. It's witchcraft. And today in our White House, they are so hungry for power that they are willing to sacrifice the blood of our children. And so in the dream, the Lord showed me this. In the dream, he said that God is about to expose the witchcraft. He's about, you're about to see some bombshells drop. You're about to see some things exposed. And the other thing I didn't tell you, Pastor, was at the end, I told my wife this morning, was that I do see revival coming because, but it has to be a revival of repentance, not healing, not miracles, not, it has to be a revival of repentance or we will go nowhere as a country. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. We went, we went in my office, Brother Davis. I just got to, I got to tell you what I see that, that these men are so hungry for power that they're willing to sell their souls, sell their souls to the devil himself to stay in power. And the devil demands blood sacrifice. The devil demands the blood of innocence. And so Moloch is angry. Moloch is angry right now. And when, when, uh, when they made a covenant with the devil yep. that you keep us in power, we'll keep the sacrifices coming. Yeah. Now the sacrifices are ending. The devil's going to tear into them yep. and start pulling them down for betraying him oh, yeah. and for violating their, their covenant with him. Yeah. Look, it is a spiritual thing. Yes, it is. They sacrifice not unto God. They called it Chemosh. They called it. Moloch, they called it Baal, they called it by many names. But the Lord said they sacrifice to the devil. Yeah, they right. sacrifice to the devil, Amen. not to God. Let's stand and pray for our country. Amen. And for all those who are in authority here. Yes. Father, we do pray for our, our nation. Yes. I thank you, Lord, for the justices who, who did vote, who did end this constitutional right for abortion yes. and left it up to individual states to decide. But we know this is far from being the end of abortion. Lord, I pray for all those who are in authority across this land to have a come to God moment. Let them have a come to God awakening. Lord, we pray a mighty shaking. We pray. I pray, Lord, that you depose, that you remove those who are in places of authority, promoting the shedding of the innocent, Lord, the innocent blood. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for this nation. I pray, Lord, for the appointment and election of men and women of godly conviction. Lord, have mercy on us, we pray. Lord, we know we are a nation deserving of wrath. Lord, we, we do pray for mercy, being that there are more than 10 righteous, more than 10 righteous. Have mercy upon America, have mercy upon this land and, and, and upon the lands of the world, Lord, for this grave, this grave sin of mass murder of, of the most innocent of all. Lord, cause us to be aware that this is a great spiritual battle. 
Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to you, to your spirit, to be aware of the warfare waging around us, raging all around us. And, and in this evil time, help us one and all to walk circumspectly. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If we can pray with you this morning, you come. We'll pray before we dismiss. You come. We'll pray. We believe the Lord is present to meet every need. clean hands and give us pure heart and lift our souls to another give us clean hands give us pure heart and let's not lift our souls to another oh God let us be Generation that sees, that sees your face, oh God, your love. And God, let us be a generation that sees, that sees your face, oh God, your love.